Hello, Salt Strong Nation, Joe Simon. It's like diamonds almost thrown off there. I guess Zoom is doing something new where you've got this female voice in your ear. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. Recording in progress. Oh, yeah. Almost freaked me out there. But we're talking about catching inshore slams, really just tight lines in general while on vacation. This is summertime. We're, we're entering the the midst of just hot days and and travel and fun and family and fishing. And one thing we hear over and over, and we've all been there, is hey, you know, I'm I'm here. I saw earlier today in the community there was one, hey, I'm I'm in Jacksonville. And I, I saw you got to that person really quickly, Courtney. Um, you know, never been here, never fished here. I just want to get some tight lines. I don't have a boat. That, that's usually the thing that follows it up. And so we got Wyatt, Justin, Courtney, all going to share some stories and, and really some tips and tactics on how to maximize your time on vacation. So Justin, I'm going to throw it to you because this is your idea. Uh, talk, talk through maybe some of the, the problems and the obstacles. And then, you know, some of the things that you found to be super helpful uh, when you're on vacation. And, and, and I know you, you have a couple of stories too, where you were on vacation in an area that might have a new species that you hadn't really caught before, or, or maybe hadn't caught in many years. So talk through all that. Yeah, for sure. We see a lot of questions from everybody in the community and through email and comments on any video posts we make about, you know, I'm heading down to an area, uh, for, you know, for vacation with my kids and my family. And, um, and I, you know, I just want to know, like, what do I need to do? What, what, what rod and reel do I need to have? What lures should I try to throw? Um, some people are like, I've never caught a redfish or I've never caught a snook and I'm heading down to the beach. Um, so this kind of really stemmed from you guys asking like, how can we better prepare ourselves to be successful? And, uh, and, and I, I do think that it can be daunting in the beginning because you think there's so much information that you think you need to learn to be successful. But the reality is, is that it's about keeping it simple. Um, you know, try, you, you definitely can, can go overboard and trying to dig online and find out tides and wind and season and species, what are they eating? But um, fortunately here in Salt Storm, we have a community and you have all of us, if you're a member to reach out to and ask specific questions that, you know, can help you be more successful in that time. Um, I mean, just to kind of start it off, uh, I, I do kind of want to lead in with a story and say, I remember a time when uh, I went down to Sanibel Island for the first time. For those that don't know where that is, that's Southwest Florida. And uh, in the summer months for a week, my family would rent a condo on the beach. And I've, I'd caught small snook before, like little 18 inch snook off of a dock in you know, Sebastian area. And, but I've really wanted to catch those big snook on the beach. And I didn't have a boat. I didn't have a kayak. I didn't have any way to get around. And I know Sanibel has a lot of people and it's probably really pressured. And I just wanted to know, what do I do? Like, can I use my inshore rods and reels? Do I need a beach setup? What lures do I throw? What are they even eating? What do I look for on a beach? And I started just going online. This was, oh my gosh, 12 years ago. I mean, it was a while ago. And, um, you know, I was looking online trying to find like what to use and uh, found spoons you know, X wraps, Miradines, and a couple different lures, but really I was trying to key in on, you know, what were they, what are these fish eating? Are, are they eating pilchards? Are they eating shrimp? You know, and, and just kind of go from there. Um, and I found that, uh, you know, asking questions uh, locally when I was down there or reaching out to friends on Facebook, you know, this is, this is before Salt Strong, before a community platform, asking for help, asking people that have been successful. And I found that a lot of people were willing to share their experience with me and help me be successful because it's about giving and helping others. It's rewarding. So that was, uh, you know, that, 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 what I learned in that short period of time is always ask for help. Um, use resources, uh, like the salt strong page, ask questions in the search tool, email us, and uh, we'll be happy to give you some, give you some feedback. I'm going to let my dog out while we're on this call. Who let those dogs out? Who, <laughs> he wants to join in. <laughs> Uh, I, I could not agree more with you, Justin. Um, honestly, if we ever go on vacation and, you know, we want to definitely get on fish, the first place we stop at is a bait and tackle shop and just start asking questions. 
you know, what are the fish biting right now? You know, what, uh, you know, where are good spots at? And that's, that's one of the first things that we do. And of course now with, with the community, it's so easy. You put a question out there, Hey, I'm going, you know, down to Fort Myers this weekend, you know, what can I expect? What should I bring? And within minutes you have an answer. So that's pretty awesome. Um, but if you are looking specifically for bait and tackle shops, I actually found a super cool app it's called Bait Finder. And you just put in your location, you can actually drop a pin of exactly where you are and it pulls up hundreds of bait shops right around. Um, it's, it's super cool. So I always use that as a resource as well. It's awesome. And speaking of bait, uh, we will talk a little bit about the kind of the, the must have lures, because that's, that's obviously a whole lot simpler than having to worry about, especially if you don't have a boat, trying to keep live bait live. Even shrimp sometimes can be a hassle if you just have like a short amount of time, an hour sort of fish on the beach. And we'll talk about lures as, uh, as well. Wyatt, what do you got? What's, I know you got some stories because you, I mean, when you even started with salt strong, you were in Tennessee and then moved to North Carolina, a place you never fished before. And then all of a sudden the next day you're in Texas, it seemed like, and a brand new spot. And in both places, you did not have a boat. And so you were kind of on vacation uh, and you still managed to catch a lot of fish. Yeah. So, you know, transitioning to all these different areas. And even when I lived in Tennessee, uh, you know, those were all vacation trips to the coast that I was taking. So I had to really focus in on pre-planning. We're going to talk about all that. Uh, I had to focus in on pre-planning. Finding local information is extremely important to, you know, know what the seasonal patterns of fish are, what their current trends are, things like that. The stuff that we hammer home a lot, you know, if you're not in tune with those things, uh, knowing where to find those resources is really important. So, you know, when I was going, taking vacation trips, there was probably more research done uh, before the trip, you know, in terms of time spent uh, than I actually got to fish during the trip. So pre-planning is the most important thing that you need to be doing, uh, you know, before you actually get to the water, if you want to have success and knowing what you need to be looking for. There's a lot of questions that, you know, if you're taking a vac uh, vacation to an area that you've not been to, uh, there's a lot of questions you probably don't even know to ask, even just going from one type of estuary, you know, for example, some of the inshore waters uh, in the Gulf of Mexico um, versus the Atlantic coast, uh, most people don't know the difference in tide swings and just the tide alone, how that plays an effect on fish is really big. We're going to cover all of that, but I would say that, you know, biggest, biggest thing you need to be doing if you're going on vacation uh, is do your research and we're going to cover all aspects of that. Um, and I'm going to have some pretty interesting <laughs> stories to share with mistakes I've made because I didn't know what questions to ask. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to dive into all that uh, here soon. Cool. Well, I I'm just going to start off with a tactic because I get this question a, a lot too is, hey, and I'm in a new spot. You let's just assume you're going to be somewhere near the beach. You're uh, clear clearly on vacation near salt water. And I would just, if I can only pick one thing, it would be a bridge. Uh, and, and I don't know of any city that's on the water that doesn't have some bridge. And if you show me one, I'll show you a pretty sad city. But all cities that, that you're vacationing in on saltwater are going to have a bridge, if not many bridges. And, and I'm not talking about like the obvious one that's going over the entire intercoastal or the, you know, the skyway. There are so many smaller bridges you know, that, that are going from little, it could be a little barrier island, just something small. And some of those, I mean, one, you know, that it's close to the, you know, either the inlet or a pass in most cases. So you're going to have a lot of fresh moving water and two, it's structure. I mean, there's are two things you have to have. And, and I mean, I, I've done a couple of reports there in Placida. There's a couple of different bridges that people drive over all the time and are just absolutely loaded with fish. And I'll take one lure. I would literally just take a slam shady on a one fourth ounce jig head and, you know, some leader line in case I get broke off in the structure. And, and I have caught fish 100% of the time, not every single, you know, night, but it usually I go in the evening time after the kids have gone to bed. And if I'm there for three nights, 100% of the time, I'm catching fish at least two out of, out of the three nights. I'll have a couple of times where I'm getting strikes, but just not landing anything. And I've done that on multiple bridges. And as long as you got moving water and you have, you know, at least a bait that's going to get down to the right water column, you will catch some fish. <clears throat> Obviously, if you want to take it to the next level, get some shrimp. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible 
not to catch some little snapper, some small grouper, something with live shrimp around a bridge. And once again, every city that you're going to be visiting that has saltwater will have at least one bridge, if not many bridges. So do a little research. You can find them on Google Maps. And sometimes you might have to fish on top of the bridge. The one insider report I did there in Placida, you can actually go under the bridge. So it's got a, a slight causeway. You can fish on a part of the causeway and actually go underneath the bridge as well and just start skipping lures right underneath there and hit the hidden off the pilings. It's absolutely deadly. And so I would say a bridge and or a causeway. Once again, all pretty much all cities that you're going to be visiting have some type of causeway that usually leads to a bridge or is part of the bridge taking you a little bit closer to the beaches. And those are always great places to fish during, uh, during the summertime. And uh, once again, for me, I'm, I'm keeping it super, super simple. We, we talked about uh, earlier on a call for the team about being minimalist, right? About not having to carry a ton of stuff. I might take two rods. Many times it's just one rod, a little, you know, fanny pack of, uh, of, of new leader and some of the, my little braid cutting scissors and a couple jig heads and a couple slam shitty paddle tails. And that's all I need. And so that's, that's my kind of a uh, tip that if, I'm going anywhere from Texas to North Carolina. That's what I'm going to be looking for just to keep it super, super simple. Yeah, I 100% agree. And it's, it's funny, <laughs> the interview video that I did for Salt Strong was filmed at a bridge. Uh, and that was from shore to catch speckled trout. You know, you think about the things that we look for for most inshore predators. We're looking for areas that have bait, that have good current flow, uh, and that have ambush zones. And a bridge, uh, as we've talked about, is usually situated in pretty close proximity to a pass or an inlet, or even if it's a, a man-made, you know, waterway, um, traditionally, uh, that's going to be between two larger bodies of water. So there's going to be good current flow between them, moving bait uh, from one side to the other. And typically what's going to happen is predators will stage themselves down current of whatever that structure may be, whether it's a pier piling, it could be some large broken slab of concrete uh, that was used when the bridge was built. A lot of times there is Oh, that's why? under those bridges or piling down and been rebuilt. Still there? Oh, yeah, yeah. we still got so, you. I uh, think uh, I knew you having some storms there in Texas, so we lost you for one second. Oh, yikes. Yeah, no, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, we're just looking for debris and structure, and typically those predators are going to be staging down current of those. So just kind of knowing which way that current's going to be going is uh, one of the big first steps um, in positioning, uh, just so that you can present your lures as effectively as possible. And, and that is another big thing is I wouldn't, I, I typically would not reckon if you're on vacation, it is so difficult to maintain live bait. You have to go out and get bubblers, things like that. It's so much easier to just have some, some basic artificial lures. Typically I I'm going to bring one or two different styles of presentations uh, to cover different columns of, uh, depths of water. So, um, I mean, and most of the time you can do it with search baits, uh, just by adjusting the, the jig head. So, if I'm just going to, you know, scout a spot, in fact, that, that trip that I did, uh, that was just done with paddle tails. Um, and, you know, when Waiter Dave came down here, we went to a bridge and we just waited next to the bridge uh, and, and kind of figured out where the current was flowing, what structure was closely related to that bridge. Because a lot of bait is going to relate to those bridges as well. You know, they're getting swept by that current. They're looking for something uh, that they can kind of get out of the way of that flow and get away from predators. Uh, and eventually they do get caught up by the current. And that's where those predators are going to stage by and use those ambush zones to get an easy meal so just understanding how you know the dynamics of that specific waterway that specific bridge whatever structure it is you're fishing where the feeding zones are going to occur you know we talk a lot about pre-plant pre-planning with you know satellite imagery you can just trace uh knowing what the tide's going to be you can see where the water is going to flow in from that pass or inlet towards that bridge or whatever structure it is you're fishing and which way it's going to flow out on an outgoing tide. So you can plan to be there at different times, fish one side of the bridge versus the other based on where the current's going to flow. That way you can actually present your bait. So you already have a game plan of where you need to be, what you need to throw, exactly where you need to be standing before you even get there. And having that you know, game plan is what's going to result in you getting onto some good fish. Good stuff. Courtney? Uh, we're talking about bridges. I want to give you a chance to speak because I'm sure you're going to say another B word, which is beaches. What do you, what are your thoughts? Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I think for beaches specifically, you know, when you are doing your pre-trip planning, you know, using Google maps to find those accesses is going to be crucial. Uh, making sure that you're finding parking because not all of those accesses have parking. 
Um, so that part of the pre-trip planning, if you're going to beaches specifically, um, is definitely crucial. You know, if you're renting a beach house and you're just walking out on the beach behind your house, great. Uh, but most of the time you're going to need to find an access somewhere. Uh, I would say the other biggest thing for beaches would have some would be to have some kind of knowledge of how to read a beach um, and kind of what you're looking at you know, when you're watching the wave action and trying to find the structure to find fish is going to be really key. And if you have at least some knowledge of what you're looking for to try to find a run out, you know, try to find a deep trough, then that's going to put you in a much better position than if you have no idea and you're just blind casting out. So let's assume that all of our listeners have no idea what to look for. What is, what is a runoff? Uh, like <laughs> what, you know, boil it down to this, because that, that is one of the toughest parts. You know, I, I'm guessing the majority of people that go on vacation are going to some type of beach and they get there and it all looks the same. What, what are you, what are you doing? And we can spend some time on this because it's, it's, it's probably one of the easier ways besides a bridge. I'm partial to that uh, just because it's, it's kind of hard to mess it up. You know where the structure is, whereas a beach, it all, it all kind of can look the same. So talk about the different terms and exactly what you're looking for. And, and how do you know when it's like a dead zone where you can look at it and say, you know what, I just, I wouldn't fish there. I'd, I'd go here and then why? Yeah, so I actually just did a deep dive into how to read a beach and kind of what all of that structure means and why it's important. Um, so definitely check that out. But I would say the biggest thing that you wanna be looking for is wave action. And you know when you see the breaking waves, waves don't just break on their own, they're breaking because of the structure that's underneath the water. So when you see a breaking wave, it's because there's a sandbar. Uh, below it, or it's at the shore, and we call that the shore break. Uh, so let's say you're standing on the beach and you're looking straight out, you see a breaking wave, you know, 20 yards to your left, you know, in front of you, and then there's really nothing breaking um, in between that, and then to the right, there's another breaking wave. Uh, if there's breaking wave, smooth water, breaking wave, and then there's a, a a pass almost, the, the fish highway, uh, between the shore break and uh, the that first deep trough. That deep trough is where the fish are gonna be kind of cruising, cruising through. And then you see those two sandbars and then that middle spot that's smoother, that's a run out. And so when all of that wave energy and that wave action is coming in, all that water that's coming into the beach has to go back out somewhere. And that's your that's gonna be your run out. So when you see that smoother water, that's typically a, a deeper part of water. When you see the waves and the foam, that's your, your shallower water. And if, if the water is clean and clear, then you can also tell by water color, right? So the lighter the color, you know, the, the less deep the water is, the darker the color, the, the deeper the water. So I, I mean, those would be the keys. Finding the deep trough, so, you know, the space right past the shore break, um, this is typically on a on a higher tide as well. Um, that is, you know, a deeper color, less foam, no waves. That's your deep trough. Then you've got your sandbar breaking. That we would call that your first bar, uh, and and that's where you know the sandbar is. And it's really great to have bait in around those sandbars and then in the deep trough as well, because when the waves break on the sandbar, it stirs up all that bait. So that's where you want to be. That's good. So these uh, run offs, run outs, run offs, mm -hmm. run out. How, how, how many like in, a, and I'm just trying to, it's tough to like say an exact uh, amount of, of space, but if you're out there just kind of looking and scanning, how many of those are you going to be able to, to see or be able to maybe walk to? Are you usually going to have one every hundred yards, miles? Uh, how, how, how many for the, for the newbie who's going out there saying, all right, I, I don't even, I don't even know. Cause sometimes too, like, it's very rare to see like zero waves. It might be a smaller wave, right? Uh, and maybe you guys are just lucky in Jacksonville, but I feel like when I go, I'm, uh, I'm like, all right, that's kind of the area. Cause the waves are, you know, like that, but there, it's never just like a completely flat, calm area. So how, how, how long the trough is like how, 
from shore break to like the first sandbar you're talking about how long it is like on average or um no i was talking about more about the runouts um you know let's just say you had a 10 mile stretch of beach how many runouts do you have one two 50 a million that really just depends on the beach and you know the one of the biggest things about beaches and beach structure is it changes so much you know we could have a big nor'easter and all of those runouts and that really nice deep trough that was there a week ago may not be there this week and that i mean that can literally happen if the winds if the winds are right and the currents are, are ripping you may lose all that structure so that's why it's that that's the biggest thing is knowing how to read it so you can go find it and not being afraid to move because if you're there and nothing's happening, like you said, Joe, with the dead zone, move because, you know, the fish, the fish aren't there. The fish move. I think you should move too. I think, <laughs> yeah, I would say probably one of the easy for somebody that's new, probably one of the easiest ways to find a run out is if you go out at low tide and if, you know, you're going to a new area, you can very easily go on smart fishing tides, which is a, a platform that we provide. Uh, and you can look and see exactly when low tide is going to be, you know, check your watch and set a timer. Uh, make sure you get out there at the bottom of low tide. And the easiest way to spot a run out is as you're walking along the beach, that water line has obviously receded. What's usually going to happen when you're walking, you know, close to where the waves are breaking against the shore, uh, you'll look back towards where the, uh, the, the high water line was. And uh, Courtney explained this very well in her video. I highly recommend you guys go watch it. Uh, when that water line drops out, there's still going to be some water that's in that runoff because it's, you know, basically a trough. If you've ever seen that there's a, a pool of water that's further up the beach and there's water still running out towards, you know, that, that shoreline at low tide, those runoffs are, you know, still there. They're, they're shoreline structure uh, that's like built into the sand. They don't go away when the tide's gone. So you'll very clearly see where water moves into that kind of little cut. And it's these pools that are still standing at low tide. Now, obviously, what you can do is just mark a pin on your map where that was so that when the high tide comes back in and that water is over that hole that, you know, you, if you're not experienced with reading the water, reading the beach, reading the waves, uh, you know where it is because you marked it on your map and you can kind of have a, a good visual cue of exactly where you need to cast to be at the entrance to that runoff or in the hole uh, where all that, you know, that, that kind of trough dumps into. Because usually what's going to happen is you're going to have this stretch that's, you know, really thin it's maybe three four feet wide uh, and it runs out to the to the water uh, and then you've got this big open pool that's further up and a lot of times what will happen is those fish will run through that that trough um and that that runoff and they'll get into that, that pool and they'll sit there that's exactly what they look like yep that's it right there that's exactly what they I've look like so i've never seen that before and that's so again so, so my question so at is, low tide <laughs> so on, on, so here's the question i was trying to ask so at low tide if i went down to where you fish how many of those am I going to see within eyesight? Like, is it 10 or am I going to only see like two that I could walk to in general? That's, it's like that's tough. I mean, in Jacksonville, I mean, there are some beaches where we could have a run out every 50 yards okay. or so, which is awesome. Uh, but there are some beaches that have no structure at all. It's, it's, it's like oyster bars. Crazy. It, it's just a, it's a structure that's, you know, it just happens in some places. It's not a uh, predefined or, you know, regional specific. It's just something that happens, you know, where seagrass happens to grow one year, uh, it, you know, these, these runoffs and the way that the, the beach structure happens, uh, it's just dependent on the weather and that can change if you get a big storm or things like that. So it's tough to pre-plan runoffs um you know a lot of times you have to go out and scout what you can pre-plan is things like points or rocks which is when i would travel to the coast the panhandle uh, when i lived in tennessee i'd go to port st joe um and you know you can scout rock walls rock walls are easily spotted that structure that doesn't move and that's a really easy area for a beginner to be on the beach and you know go throw some you know shrimp near or uh, go throw fish bites things like that you can throw lures near those rocks get on jacks bluefish uh, flounder hang around those rocks on the beach, things like that around this time of year. So that is a, a piece of structure you can easily see by scouting satellite maps uh, and know that that's always going to be there. If you don't want to mess around with walking around at low tide, maybe you don't have time to do that. It doesn't work out with the family schedule, whatnot. You can scout hard structure like rocks and points that does not move, um, you know, but a lot of times some of the best fishing is going to be in those runoffs for your pompano, your whiting, uh, those, those, 
species that a lot of times most people are trying to get on the beach because they do run the beach. They use that, you know, moving structure um, as, you know, where they're going to get their meals because a lot of times they don't sit around rocks all day. They will take quick pit stops there, but, uh, you know, they're, they're generally going to be continuously moving down the beach. This, like, this is better than I could have even thought. Like, I never knew what these runouts were. I mean, anybody like this is great. That's what it's all about. It's about talking to other people and networking and, and using your resources to find information. I, I've walked many a beach on the West coast of Florida and the Gulf South of like Crystal River for Snook. And it's not, a, it's not as common of a thing as over on the East coast in, in Jacksonville or maybe even further up in the Northeast in Georgia or the Carolinas. Those are things that you guys are like, oh yeah, that's something you look for. And that's excellent information. Like we wouldn't have known that if we didn't have a, a community or a place to ask these kind of questions to learn about that before I travel. Now I know if I go to Jacksonville, I'm going to look for something like that. That's awesome. Like, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have this, this kind of resource to communicate with people and, and better ourselves before we go on a trip. So like, I'm super excited. I never knew that existed. When you showed me a picture I was like, oh, it's like a tidal pool kind of, and the water dips out. It makes perfect sense. Moving water, flushing bait, unique piece of structure, unique, something different than like vast miles of beach. Um, yep. so Joe, like your question, like, you know, how is it universal? Like, is it like that everywhere? I've never seen that on the West Coast. Or yeah, like I mean, the Gulf, the Gulf doesn't have the, the power. And the, I mean, the waves are pretty puny. I mean, you need, you need <laughs> yeah. to have some serious water movement to like, that's a lot of sand to push. I mean, yeah. that's like a lot of power. Um, yeah, that's that's really, really cool. So I, I love to hear you just, we talked about bridges, causeways, beaches. What, what do you have like a go-to that that you like to like, I don't know, maybe you're more comfortable with or your confidence types of spots if you're uh, on vacation or in a new area? Definitely. Without, without a boat. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um I, I will agree that structure and moving water are going to be the two things that I'm looking for. The snook on the beach thing, it, you know, it can be kind of an exception because they're always moving and you can just walk and walk and walk and walk and throw lures all day long and, and catch fish. But if you're, if you don't have that type of species or in that scenario of snook on the beach and I wanted to go somewhere, you know, I wanted to go to Jupiter or Southeast Florida where there, where there are bridges and there's only a couple intercoastal waterways and, you know, the beach access doesn't have great fishing. Um, I'll, I'll look for moving water. I'll look for structure. Um, I, I do like to find little culverts and um, places in the back country or places where there uh, is like a small, a small creek, if you will. Like a, a culvert with moving water, I think is excellent for any species. And I try to find those inland in, in a, like a main intercoastal waterway or a main river. The Indian River on the east coast of Florida runs a long, long way. I'll spend a lot of time and look on Google Maps and look for these little feeder creeks that connect to the Indian River. And then I'll look at what direction is the wind flow. Um, if we're going to have a strong east wind, and I'm on the west side, the west like land uh, base side of Florida, then all that wind's gonna blow into that little feeder creek. And naturally there's gonna be a lot of mud minnows and mullet and croakers and pinfish that are flushing through that entry point. Um, I'll set up there and, uh, and I'll, I'll try to fish uh, presenting into the wind and drifting a lure back so that it looks like bait fish are entering back into that sanctuary or that little feeder creek. Um, but anywhere that I'll go, if I can find land access, to little culverts with moving water, all of your bait's going to stack up there. And, and why you pointed out fish positioning and, and where these fish position to ambush prey is big. Um, sometimes they will be down current and sometimes they'll be up at the beginning point to ambush that bait. Um, but a lot of times if I find a culvert and water's gushing out of it, um, I won't fish the beginning, the entry side where the water's flowing in, I'll fish the outflow side. Um, and I, I love using the power prawn on a jig head. I think that just slowly bouncing and yo-yoing a shrimp presentation. I mean, shrimp can't fight the current the way that a bait fish can. So it seems like a much easier lure to present that's a little disoriented and swirling around at those, uh, those moving water points. Um, so if I were to go blind right now and I wanted to have the best chance of getting a trout or a small redfish or even a decent sized snook, like a member that I fished with this past weekend got a monster like almost 40 inch snook 
on a slam shady uh, around a little culvert point with moving water um, is I, I would I would look at Google Maps and I would find land access points where you're not on someone's private residence, um, a public park or an area that I can walk to or safely park and pull off the side of the road. And I'd fish these little culverts with moving water and I'd use a slam shady on a, on a jig head. Um, you know, a quarter ounce is great. She can move it a little bit faster and bounce around. Or I'd throw a power prawn on a jig head for sure. Those would be the two things that I would have as, as good presentations and good universal lures to use just about anywhere. What about you guys? We'll, we'll stick to the must have if you can only take, I don't know, let's just say three max in terms of lures. What, what would you take, Wyatt and Courtney? Yeah. So um, I, I would say that uh, right now, being that it's summertime, most of the fish are going to be foraging on bait fish, you know, your small, medium sized bait fish. I really don't think that a paddle tail can be beaten, especially for someone that's on vacation that is trying to cover ground in an area that they haven't been to. Paddle tails are phenomenal search baits. You can cover so much ground so quickly, so effectively. A lot of lures, you got to work them at a certain speed with a certain retrieve to get your maximum chances of a strike. A slow, constant retrieve with a paddle tail or a medium paced retrieve with a paddle tail, uh, you know, if you're just trying to cover a little bit more ground, it is so hard to, to you know, find a lure that can effectively cover as much ground while still getting the highest percentage of strikes uh, that a paddle tail does. So, you know, you're continuously moving around trying to find out where the pockets of fish are. I see a lot of people that are on vacation, they'll fish one spot for four days straight and, you know, they don't know why they're not catching fish. It's just, you know, that spot statistically has not provided for you. So you need to, you know, start expanding your reach so you can start finding data elsewhere. If you start getting bites elsewhere, you're going to start getting more data. You start kind of fishing around there. Think of fishing as a numbers game. You need to continuously be searching new zones until you start getting, you know, your, your success. Uh, so continuously covering areas. I love waiting when I'm in an area that I've not been to um, because it allows me to, you know, especially if you're on vacation, you don't have a boat. Uh, most of the fish that we're looking for are close to these shallow flats or shallow grass flats, things like that. And, and those are, you know, two feet, three feet max in depth. Uh, and a lot of times they'll be hanging out on the edges and sometimes they're not as close to the shoreline. So just sticking to a shoreline uh, can, can kind of limit you. Uh, and, and a lot of people, I think, will, will say that, you know, changing up your lures is going to help you catch more fish. I'm not even going to say three lures. I think you only just need one and you need to focus more on being efficient with the area that you're covering. So I'm just going to actually say one paddle tail and make sure that you're still moving around. If you, if you can wade, um, I would recommend you do that and you continuously walk and you cover different angles and don't hit the same angle uh, twice uh, until you start, you know, catching fish or you start getting hits and then you can slow it down and start mixing up your retrieve, but just constantly retrieving to work different angles move further up the flat 20, 30 yards and start doing the same thing again, fan cast, and then keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, keep finding that structure, moving water, uh, and, and just kind of dissect those areas with those paddle tails. And you will find fish a lot faster than sitting in one spot, changing between five, six different lures, even three different lures, uh, and having to worry about all that. So I'm just going to say one, I'm going to say, I'm just going to need the paddle tail. Keep it simple. Find the <laughs> 90 10 zone. Specialist. Specialist. Simple. Yes. Specialist. You guys missed that episode. We'll put a link down <laughs> below to both the simplifying specialist and the 90 10 zone. It, it, it's so critical. I mean, in, on the beach, it's these run outs, run offs. Uh, I mean, once you can find in some of these bridges, right, you'll, you'll find if you make enough cast, there's going to be usually one area, whether it's just deeper, more water flowing through it, or, you know, someone has some old structure down there or they rebuild a bridge and there's some old pilings and concrete down there. There's usually going to be a couple. And if you've ever been diving, as you guys know, we go lobster in every single year in the keys and we hit up a lot of the bridges and it's amazing that it'll, I mean, in a, let's just say you have 15 big, big uh, bridge pilings. It'll be usually two, maybe one that has like everything and it's all the structure and that's where all the fish are and we'll look up and you'll see people who are fishing and i was like you might want to come over here after we finish lobstering we don't want to get hooked but it's it's so eye-opening when you go down there with a mask and you actually see what's down there and you're like that piling that piling has literally nothing and this one piling will have all the fish all the sharks everything will be around 
the one with all the extra extra structure it's a little bit deeper and all the bait will be there it's really really fascinating have you ever um, been superstitious and like looked at pilings and see if somebody marked them or used a little piece of bow or something to like when you're looking at a bridge piling you're like i wonder which one's the magic one well down down there they're all they're all numbered and so you could yeah, you, know, you know, hey man, number thirty-seven. It's got all the fish on it. Yeah, like, I'm not going to give you the one. There's one number that uh, we we usually kill it at, but uh, yeah, it's now now my new lucky number. Um, that's that's good, Courtney. What about you? You obviously do a lot of beach fishing, so I'm going to assume you're going to say some fish bites. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, but if I were if I were only taking lures, I definitely agree with Wyatt. I would have a slam shady with me. Uh, but I would also I I bring a gold or silver spoon, for sure. Pretty universal. Um, yeah, bait wise, uh, keeping live bait obviously is hard, but fresh dead shrimp works amazing on the beach, and it's super simple. Uh, and then fish bites. 100%. I like how you said fresh dead shrimp, not frozen shrimp, because there yes. is a difference in the quality. There is a big difference. Yeah. There is a big difference. That's cool. So Good I thing. am going to have to, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to go back because I forgot we were talking about beach fishing as well. I would have to also say a spoon because, um, you know, most of the fish we're targeting off the beach uh, are very toothy and I don't want to you know, even those Z-Mans, you know, the mackerel will tear up soft plastics uh, oh, and, yeah. and spoons. Uh, and a lot of times you don't want to be burning through $50, $60 worth of lures, having to go to that tackle shop that's uh, on close to your, your beach house that you're staying in and, and burning through all that. Um, so I would definitely say a hard, hard spoon um, for all those toothy critters that are out there, the blues, the max, all that stuff that's running here in the summertime for the beach fishing. But if you're inshore, all you need is a paddle tail for sure. This isn't but that spoon exact, will also work. This oh, isn't yeah. the exact one, but yeah, like the silver spoon was the thing that I caught the most snook on fishing down in Sanibel. And I remember when I was doing my research, I was trying to figure out what to what to use, thinking I had to use a realistic lure. We, we talked about this before, thinking like that's the best thing I needed to be successful. And my brother and my dad were like, "No, we gotta use we gotta use a silver spoon. That's what all the guys get the snook on." I was like, "What, what, what, do, you, what do you know? You've never caught a snook either." Sure enough, like that was it. Four out of five times and the biggest snook I've ever caught on the beach, like 41, 42 inches, massive, was on a silver spoon. And in the middle of the daytime too, like That's three awesome. in the afternoon. So for real, spoon. For real. So it's the timing of, brings up one other really important topic. Why it touched on it is smartfishingtides.com. That's, you know, if you're an insider member, you have full access to that. That's critical when you're on vacation, because one, it's obviously going to show you everything you need from the tides to what the wind is doing to now we have sonar in there. So, you know, if you have that spot that maybe you saw on a satellite map, which is also in smart fishing tides, then right below it, you can actually go see the depth. And say, oh yeah, you know that that is a little hole down there. Uh, this is a little bit deeper. Maybe there is some something unique uh, here. And uh, so it's basically has every tool that you possibly need. It's smart fishing tides. Once again, for our members to to you know just to give you an advantage over the fish, and and ultimately just tell you the best time, right? Because when you're on vacation, I'm assuming you're there with someone else. You know, most people don't go vacation completely by themselves. And you're going to be spending time with those other people, whether it be boyfriends, girlfriends, wives, kids, family, whatever, your family reunion. And so, you know, it's also important that the day before, the week before, whatever, that you're scheduling out your time. Like I said, for me, it's at nighttime a lot, which is a great time to go, by the way, on vacation or super in the morning or early in the morning, especially on the beaches. You know, there are some areas where they're not overbuilt, but in, in Florida here, it's very few and far between. And if you try to go out there at 10 in the morning or even nine, sometimes you've already missed your chance. You've got all kinds of chaos and, and it gets just really, really, really tough the longer that the day goes. So I would say start super early from vacation and then knock it out. And then you get to go spend the rest of the time with your, you know, your family, whoever you're with, or in the, in the evening is a great time to do it. But that smart fishing tides is a game changer. And anytime on vacation, that's what we have we have up. And of course, it tells you what the strike score, you know, it, if you guys aren't familiar with that, it's it's a really a number, like a, a, a grade, if you will, from one, one being the worst, 10 being the best. 
to tell you, hey, this is going to be a really good day. And then he even breaks it down in each day by time period. So it'll tell you, hey, at, at uh, you know, six o'clock from six to seven is going to be your best chance to go out there and get some tight lines based on, you know, the, the moon activity and the wind and, you know, like 15 other things that make up the secret KFC recipe for uh, for smart fishing tide. So definitely, definitely use that. If you're not a member, what the heck are you waiting on? Uh, if you like this stuff, this is our free stuff. This is the stuff we put out there just because we're a little bit bored sometimes. And obviously I'm kidding. We, we, we're big believers in just giving as much as we can. Uh, and then, you know, knowing that we reserve the, the very, very best stuff and, and just our time uh, to our Insider members. That's where we're actually putting all of our own personal Insider reports. We're now doing these live coaching calls every single Thursday. And then on Friday, every single week, 52 weeks out of the year, Luke is getting on uh, satellite maps in 10 minutes or less and just going through kind of curating all of the trends that are happening inside our community and really just trying to boil down a week's worth of information into 10 minutes to tell you exactly where you should go fish. Uh, it just, it takes all the guesswork out of it. It just gives you one more edge over the fish and your fishing buddies. Uh, and I mean, you know, there's nothing better than coming home to the, to the, to the family with a, just a phone chock full of uh, a fish picks and nothing worse than going back and your head hung low and saying you got skunk. Cause you didn't know what a run out was like Justin and I did. <laughs> all the, all the wasted trips guys. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, it's, that's so cool. I'm going to look for that. Yeah. Uh, man, it's, it's, it's funny. People go on vacation. They want to spend time with their families. And a lot of times it's, it's a good chance for people to introduce their kids to, to fishing as a sport. And it's tough to get kids hooked if they're not having fun. And there's things yeah. you can do with certain baits uh, to make it fun and whatnot, but ultimately helping a kid land a fish is, uh, what's really going to keep them hooked. So you need to do your research if you want to be successful. And then, you know, like we've talked about, it's not just showing up to a spot or showing up to a random part of the beach and throwing out one of those big chunky metal rigs. That's got some shrimp on it. There's a lot more that goes into it than that. 90% of the time, it's going to be based on, you know, picking the right spots. Um, you know, there's a very small percentage where it does actually come down to, you know, the right lure and presentation, but most of the time it's just about picking the right type of spots, the right time of day, right tides, things like that. That's all the stuff that we share in the community and, you know, just in the insider club in general, we've got all these courses uh, that literally will have you set up and ready to rock and roll, um, you know, by the time you hit the beach. So I highly recommend you guys get it. It's it's probably the best thing you can do for your fishing game. It's going to help you and your family catch more fish without a doubt. Love it. Guys, anything else? Super helpful. Uh, I Yeah, I think we'd all love any and all feedback. If uh, there's anything that we missed, you know, if you're going to some crazy place, you know, I don't know that this is going to work in beaches of Croatia, but it probably will. Uh, you know, it's been really cool, you know, because we, we own Slam Shady, and, uh, you know, Z-Man licenses it from us. And now Slam Shady is because Z-Man is worldwide now. They have now taken our Slam Shady color to India because, uh, you know, India has their own Z-Man uh, Instagram account in Australia and some other random Japan. And now we're getting tagged in, uh, in some of these cool fish picks from other countries, which is uh, pretty awesome. So Slam Shady is universal officially worldwide uh but yeah definitely leave you some feedback on any specific places you're traveling and of course if you're an insider member get on these thursday calls uh you know there are many weeks where we're going to break down an exact area and it could be yours so get on there ask questions and uh, that's every uh, thursday at four o'clock uh we do a zoom call uh just like this hundreds of people usually uh, usually join a lot of fun and uh then of course every friday luke boils down in 10 minutes or less like literally shows you the type of spots you should be go fishing to catch inshore slams from Texas all the way up to North Carolina, really Virginia and everywhere in between and talks about what's working in terms of what lures or live bait, et cetera. So join us there. If you haven't already saltstrong.com, you'll see a place to join the insider club. You get more access to all of us, our other fishing coaches. I know Luke and Tony, and Andy and, and Austin couldn't, uh, couldn't make it. They're all out filming some, uh, some content for our members 
Uh, but um, yeah, we've got such a cool crew. It's so much, so much fun. And uh, that's why we got 22,000 know, members. And we were looking, I mean, so many of our members who joined when we first started this a little over five years ago, they're still here. I mean, the majority of people that started five years ago are still in the club today, which is really cool. So we're trying to think of some cool five-year gifts for our, our five-year members. And also speaking of anniversaries, Wyatt, you, you had mentioned it earlier in the, the call that you did your kind of your interview video. We, we, we basically challenged why, because we weren't even trying to, we didn't even have a job opening. Why just kind of created his own and like, all right, well, go film a video and see what you do. And that was two years ago today. So uh, happy anniversary. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, took, a, took a vacation trip like the ones we were, we were talking about. I watched all the courses and everything and picked out that bridge. And man, I was lucky to find those trout that day. Otherwise I might not be sitting here, but you know, all came down to pre-planning and the stuff that we teach in the insider club. So here I am living come, proof that it works. You've come a long way, my friend. Yes. Do you, do yeah. you remember? Do you remember like it was? Uh, it was like um, it wasn't a, a really dinky trout, but it was pretty. It was barely a keeper, and you're like, "It's a gator trout." I was like, "It's not a gator trout." Oh, uh, <laughs> so so funny going back and looking at our first videos. I was just pumped up, man. You can't be making. You can't be bringing that up. We edited that out, so it, it's not in existence anymore. Nobody heard that. Erase that from your memory. Did not call that twelve inch trout a gator. Definitely did. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure you did. Um, just like some of our first videos that are out there. Oh man, uh, yeah. If you guys want to go back and, and look at them, go into YouTube and you can sort it by oldest. And uh, there's some there's some pretty bad ones. It's pretty it's pretty scary. Yeah, it's and Luke looks wild. like a Luke looks, looks like a 12 year old boy. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Well, guys, we really appreciate you. This has been a fun one. And uh, like I said, hit us up with questions. It at saltstrong.com in the fishing tip section. We'll have this along with all the other content that we are putting out there available. And at the bottom, you'll see a place to leave a comment. It comes right to us versus YouTube. You're more than welcome to leave a comment on YouTube, but we, you know, we found it's really tough to get to those. And we always try to give precedence, the whole equitable, not equal to anyone who goes to the site at saltstrong.com and leaves comments there. Uh, cause it also tells us if you're a member or not. So if you're a member, guess what? You get your questions answered before non-members. Uh, so that's just our no another way of saying thank you guys so much. We also have some new tackle coming up, some new lures that we're working on. And of course, members will get uh, priority access before everybody else. So got some really cool stuff coming here in the summertime. That is it, guys. We appreciate you. Come join us in the Insider Club at saltstrom.com. For you current Insider members, thank you guys so much. You rock. You're the foundation of the company. And I uh, can't wait to, to see you guys on the next episode. We out. Peace.